Yeah, I think I think y'all left off uh, with Yehuda on the Ember Metal and Ember Runtime, which is uh, yep. very good uh, because you know the number of people that understand Ember Metal is basically like one hand's worth. So <laughs> better that he walk you through that, anyways. <laughs> um, so let me um, let me get this opened up here. All right, so um, so you guys did you did metal and runtime, right? Yeah. So we can we can just pick. Um, so there's a mental hierarchy that I have, um, and I can kind of walk through how they interdepend as far as I think about them. Um, although technically, now that we're using like an actual uh, like real ES6 transpiler, they can all sort of interdepend on the import whatever package or files they want. Uh, but originally, when we did the build, it was very specific linear ordering of what got loaded first when we're using like mini spade output stuff. So this is putting on your way back hats, but so, uh, so that's how I still think about it, I guess, the way they depend on each other. Um, so I guess next at the runtime would be um, um, the view package, I think. So, so at, at, after metal and runtime, um, those are very clear, like metal and runtime, uh, like in order. But then it kind of branches out. So routing technically is not directly related to views. Um, and then there's a couple of like interdependent, like routing views or routing HTML bars packages. Um, and then HTML bars, the package, the Ember HTML bars package depends directly on views. So I figure we can do views and then we can jump into Ember HTML bars and we can sort of look a little bit at how, um, how components are instantiated um, and talk through some of the workflow there if that if you want to. Yeah, great. Um, okay, so the um, I'm sure you guys went over this before, but um, these main files are just for global exports, and I wish that we could kill them all immediately, but we just can't. It's going to take some time to migrate everything to the final module path that we plan to use, um, but um, but that's not terribly important. So um, so in in the view system, we we build up uh, off of like a core view. That's like the entry level thing. It extends directly from Ember object. So everything else in the view layer extends from um, core view. Now there's one distinction, and I just want to make it clear. When I'm talking about views, I'm talking about internal to Ember, like user land, uh, ember.view is not a thing anymore, but all of the internals are still laid out in those terms. So there's still a bunch of building blocks like the ember view and then the, um, and then uh, so core view, ember view, and then component all extend in that order. So, so that's what I'm talking about. It's not necessarily a thing that you can actually extend and use uh, in app code anymore. Um, okay, so, um, so in, in um, Ember views core view package or uh, core view file, we basically see this is where the the main um, Ember object extend is for core view. We only mix in; it's very light. We only mix in evented and action handler, um, which I believe at we can look at it, but I believe it adds send um, support. Um, so this package is actually really light, and or, I'm sorry, this this object is very light. It's specifically so that we can use it as a very minimal base for future things. So it manages things like the current state, like whether it's in DOM, whether it's pre-render, whether it's has elements, I don't know. There's like five states. We can also look at those. Um, but those are the, those are the big ones that I, I recall. Um, it also um, is where the main work is done to, uh, for, uh, like, um, for Fastboot. Uh, in Fastboot, we use a different renderer, essentially, um, or a different uh, DOM helper, I'm sorry, um, which would not be document. Um, it would be simple DOM based so that it just builds up strings and elements and stuff like that. Um, so right off the bat, we can fix this. Yeah, fix all the things. Um, and uh, um, so walking through in it, essentially we're just calling super, which in this case, I actually don't think there's any, um, any of those make sense have implemented super, but you should always call super whenever you implement any framework hook, uh, period, end of story. Even if you know it doesn't need to be done, you should do it. Um, mostly because 
uh, it's a giant feature refactoring hazard if you don't. Like if you later add a mix into a thing and you didn't call super, now you're mixing either doesn't work or clobbers your actual class stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's it's massive pain and many many people um, like on Slack are like, well, you don't have to you don't have to call super from did receive adders or something. Well, technically that's true, but if you add a mix in or you change your base class, so now you have shared behavior, you have now just broken all of your code, which is really bad. So. Um, so we try not to do that. Uh, so really, this is it. So th this is just in it um, some instrumentation details, which are used by the inspector to figure out the names of the views and that kind of stuff. And then a destroy hook to make sure that the tree of DOM elements are destroyed. Um, that is basically what core view is. Um, and, uh, and, and that's that's roughly it. This, um, this trigger method is related to uh, the interface for the action handler um, mixin that we saw mixed in up top here. Um, but, uh, but core view is very light, and that's the, that's the point. Um, so I believe, and we can look at this, I believe Glimmer component extends from core view, but not from uh, the, the current Ember view. Um, so it, that's how it, it backs out of many of the mixins, like to add like class name bindings and all that jazz. But we can, we can look at that in a minute. Um, does this does this jiving? Is this making sense? Yeah, that's great. Um, okay, so the next the next up uh, the next or actually first. Um, <clears throat> so when you use the uh, the Ember Legacy Views add-on, you actually get this deprecated core view exposed. So like when we call init, it does. Um, I'm gonna fix this. I cannot look at it and not fix it. Um, so we just call uh, we just call deprecate and then and then super and do the normal thing. We also in some cases we also uh, add a deprecation upon reopen though we didn't do it here. I think we do that for link view when if we if we get there um, specifically because many people reopen link view so that they can add like data icon or something like attribute, additional attribute bindings. So if you are extending if you're doing that to Ember link view that actually changed in 2.0 to ember.link component. Right. So, because views are apparently a bad word. Uh, okay, so now we'll jump over. This is very, like, simple. Now we're going to start getting into views. Views are, um, the Ember view, like, base package is got a lot of make sense, as you see here. So um, we, can, we can go through some of them. Uh, some of them are not terribly interesting. So also you'll notice like there's a lot of docs in here. These are all the docs that end up on uh, the API doc site for Ember view the class. So all the, the header ones. So that's why we're starting out so far down in the file. Um, so recently all of the functionality in Ember view was moved into mixins and then included in the specific order. This was to pave the way for Glimmer components. So the things that needed to be shared could be shared and the things that didn't could be removed. So I guess the thing to do here, um, because there's really, there's really not much else in this file, but a bunch of mixins. So I guess the thing to do would be just start picking apart some of the mixins. Sure, sure. Is this, uh, this view class, is it private? It is private and it's not exposed right. at all. Um, the only one that is exposed is this, uh, is a deprecated one, right. um, similar to what I said before. Oh, and this one we do actually do the reopen thing. So we do a deprecation if you try to reopen a uh, view. This is only exported if you have the legacy view add-on. Yeah. Um, so the way to think about it is the legacy view add-on is providing these things. Eventually, they will actually be removed from core completely. Mm -hmm. And if you have the add-on, it'll do the, the like it'll just move that code. Um, it's not done yet because of a bunch of things, mostly probably time, <laughs> but the uh, the long term goal is we can actually remove a bunch of those legacy uh, things. All of the functionality that that add on provides can be moved into the add on. Um, for example, right now um, we probably don't we shouldn't talk about them, but like uh, container view, collection view, those guys are still in the repo and they still ship to every browser app, uh, even though unless you're using that legacy add on, you actually aren't using them. So, um, so yeah, so the goal eventually is to like, someone just needs to, you know, pick up the torch and run with it and move, start moving those, those internals out into the add-on. Uh, but it's kind of, um, tricky in some cases because the Ember test suite is of testing them. And, um, we actually currently run the Ember test suite with the, the add-on, uh, enabled, which, um, has led to a couple of bugs, but, um, 
we're trying to refactor the view, specifically the view layer tests to move towards much more similar setup that an app would use. Mm -hmm. So you'll actually provide like, like I'm probably gonna actually steal the exact um, functionality. You'll say this.render, you'll give it a template snippet, and then you can like interact with the thing. Um, I think it does two things. First of all, it's good to dog food. And secondly, um, it makes the Ember test suite much more accessible to people yep. like that actually make Ember apps that are like really good Ember developers. <laughs> the test suite is like crazy. So, yeah. um, so I think that'll be a really good thing. So at that point, uh, these tests will just be uh, hitting public APIs and that in turn will free up this exactly. Ember factor. Exactly. Yeah. So right now, many, many, many of the tests are like doing really uh, things that are, are basically crazy today that maybe they were or weren't when they were written, or maybe there was no other way to do it. Like, I, I don't know, I, you know, I probably wrote many of them. Um, but um, yeah, so things like uh, using like curly curly view dot foo to get a property off of your current local view instead of the context. Um, that's not a thing you would ever actually write in an app or uh, not in a recent Ember, like a 1.13 or 2.0 app. Um, it may have been something you did in the, the early 1.0 RC series and stuff. But, um, but it's, it's all over the code base, um, which leads to um, us for being forced to actually, to get the test done at all, we have to run it with this add-on, um, which unfortunately meant we actually broke a few things when we did some refactoring and removed those uh, view and uh, controller keywords in the template. Um, and our test suite didn't catch it, which was very, very unfortunate. So, so I have a, a giant to-do uh, issue where there's, I think, I think 15 or 20 um, like thousand line test files that basically have to be completely rewritten, which good times. Um, so, but there's a, there's an open PR where I started working on the infrastructure, actually pulling in Ember key unit. Um, I'm unsure if I'm going to continue down that path or just like rebuild the API uh, in a small, like with less, um, with less functionality, like just really this dot render and then this dot dollar. Those are the big things, and everything else from there. And Ember's test we can deal with. Like we don't need to worry too much about um, like making it the asynchrony easy to deal with. Like that's a thing we already have to deal with the run loops in Ember's test suite. Um, whereas in an app, it's not a thing that you do as much. Like in mm -hmm. app tests. Um, okay, sorry. So I am the king of rabbit holes. So just pull me back out when you want to move on. Um, so, um, so the, oh, there go. So, so the first mix in is this view context support. This basically gives the uh, context uh, computed property um, to, uh, to, to view. Um, the relationship between context um, and this are complicated. In a component, this is just a component itself. In a view, uh, pri previously, it was basically like the controller context. So, um, so this is where this is all done. Um, notice in like when we define context, I find it funny that this is private, but anyways, um, when we define context, we just return underscore context. Um, and underscore context looks to see, is there a controller defined? If there is, we return it and that's right here. Um, if there, uh, I guess if there isn't, then we go, okay, grab the parent view and then ask for its underscore context. And if it doesn't have one, then nobody's got a context and the whole thing is null, um, which I don't actually think happens unless you create a view and append it directly to the DOM without giving it any controller and any parents, which is unusual <laughs> uh, to say the least. Um, so this is the majority of the functionality here. Um, and, then, and then we got controller, which I think is roughly the same thing. Controller looks for underscore controller. Um, and when we get to the HTML bars package, we can see that underscore controller is provided when we invoke something in the template. So there's a component node manager that instantiates all the components on the screen or views, I guess, if you have the add-on. Um, and we actually specify underscore controller to be the right thing. Um, controller was this super wacky thing that was, in my mind, very emergent behavior. Um, like what the target of actions were, what controller actually returned in a bunch of different contexts in Ember early Ember 1X. It wasn't defined, and then we just happened to make it work a certain way, and if we changed it, it broke many apps. Um, so that was a source of much pain in the 113 cycle because it wasn't really clearly defined when does control, like in, you know, um, in the legacy version of each that would change context, does the controller change or just the context? 
Um, well, it was a controller, but it was bananas. Like it, unraveling it was very complicated and there's probably still bugs today about the target, especially considering like actions. So if you have an each and then you have, uh, an, in, in Ember 1X, you have an item controller. If you target, uh, if you have an action in there, it should target the outside scope, not the item controller. But I think it actually targets the wrong thing. So I'm glad that syntax is gone. So we don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, Okay, um, so then the last bit in this, uh, in this mix-in is just um, triggering some did change notifications when controller changes or um, par uh, parent view changes. Now, ultimately, I would like to actually remove these two observers. Uh, they are a source of a decent amount of pain in, um, in apps, and, uh, and it has to do with things like, uh, like Liquid Fire will, um, as it's transitioning in and out, these controller properties change. Like for example, on teardown, the controller changes to null, triggering this observer, making it walk all the child views just to be destroyed, which is mind-blowingly dumb. So, um, so we, need to, we need to figure out a better strategy for that. This is mostly added in 1X, in 1.13 for support of people doing um, very specific things with controller. Uh, like if you looked at list view uh, or Ember collection now, it was prior to like much refactoring using controller and doing a lot of internal private stuff to like deal with how to swap out, like keep the same view instances, but swap out all the underlying contacts and controllers and stuff. Um, okay, so popping back out, we'll go back to this, what's the next one? Um, child view support. And I'm just gonna tell you right now, if I don't know what the hell it does, I will say, I don't know what this thing does. Um, so, uh, so child view support essentially is um, creating the, the, the uh, like dot child views uh, array um, and it handles append child and destroy child and then I guess remove, which is calling destroy if I recall. Um, now, um, uh, and create child view. So these are called in the renderer when you add uh, new child views. Unfortunately in, uh, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, in, in Glimmer, um, so Ember 113 plus, child views, the child views array is not maintained after initial render. So once you render the first time, child views actually doesn't change. This was um, a source of some bugs for folks that were inspecting it. Um, though child views, I believe has always been private even though it's very, it's fairly well often used. Um, so the, the reason for that is because uh, essentially Ember itself, like the Ember view layer doesn't actually keep track of that at all anymore. It's all in the rendering engine. It's all in Glimmer doing the work, um, which uh, for example, when, um, when you remove uh, a given view, like if you remove a view that has 10 children, we don't want to traverse all the 10 children. We just want to like sever the tie and like just destroy the things and that's it. Uh, just call destroy on them instead of like index of and slicing or splicing out of the array. Mm -hmm. um, it would be very um, costly to have to like maintain the array over time. Um, so, um, so in theory, there is, there's things that can be done. I, I tried for a while in 1.13 because people were having issues with this as it was becoming a problem for upgrading. I tried for a while to make child views a computed property that um, would compute um, on the fly, like at, like when you get it uh, and try to figure out from the render nodes and stuff from Glimmer, which one of your other things talked a lot about, uh, from the, the render nodes to like figure out what are the actual child views and traverse the whole stack. Um, unfortunately, if I make it a CP, it isn't a CP now, it's just a regular prop. If I make it a computer property, now that's already broken everything because <laughs> you have to get it. Um, I could make it an ES5 getter, but then it's on IE8 so, uh, compat, so. So anyways, so this thing is just dealing with adding and removing child views, um, mostly on initial render. Um, legacy child, what is that? Love it when we have legacy in the name. Mm, don't know. Um, so I don't know who uses these link child and unlink child. So moving on. Um, so view state is, uh, is fun. So um, so view state is basically where we're dealing with transition to and, um, and, and this is not like the transition to you're used to in a route. This is actually transitioning from one state to another state in the, the, um, sort of view state machine. So it's either like pre-rendered, DOM, has element, those kind of things. 
Um, so transition essentially just um, is a very simple, a, a much simpler, more simplified state machine. It's just like a pojo of uh, keys. Um, so we have the prior state and the current state, and then we call exit on the prior state and enter on the, the new one, basically. That's, that's all we're doing. Um, and we'll get to where the actual states are work, and that's, I guess, uh, where is that? Uh, I don't know. It seems like the next logical thing to look at, but I don't know where it is. <laughs> um, so view states, this is where they're built up. So these are the states. This default pre-render in DOM has element in destroying. Um, but yeah. I don't know, we'll get, we'll get there. Um, it's gotta be one of these mixing, maybe it's the view mixing. Okay, unsure. So we'll, we'll get there, I guess, in a minute. Um, okay, so next thing is template rendering support. Uh, so this is very much slimmed down. This is basically only dealing with the render block. Um, and it's specifically for, it's a private thing that's used by the, um, um, by the, uh, by the, uh, Glimmer engine and um, and uh, HTML bars integration stuff. So when we if we get there, we'll uh, we'll talk about that. But it's it's just called um, to uh, to render the doc for uh, the block for uh, strings basically, uh, which isn't really an API we support anymore. So render doesn't actually like used to be. You could have render and you get a render buffer passed in. You could like push strings into the render buffer and then uh, emit it. But when we move to HTML bars in one ten. Um, that changed quite a lot. So now we start getting into some of the APIs that are uh, hopefully going away with um, with the Glimmer component. Things like class names and class name bindings. Um, so uh, this is this is where the main like concatenated properties are dealt with. But this doesn't actually the, this uh, class name support mixin isn't really doing much. Um, all it does is it defines the that class names and class name bindings should be concatenated properties, which means that um, the through the inheritance structure, if you access the property, it will like combine all the arrays of the parent classes, um, uh, and that's that's a public thing. But uh, but it's not something that many people use a lot. But it's definitely a public thing. Uh, and then it uh, it defines the default class name of Ember View, which is what we see on like every view in the DOM essentially. Um, so that's that's basically it for here. Um, when when we actually get through the HTML bars process, the 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 magic of what these class name bindings do is all in there. So it, it grabs this array, it iterates the array. Figures out well what's the you know because there's a, like two or three micro syntaxes that we have to support to like um, grab the thing and then um, like look for index of question mark and you know like all that like if it's truthy or falsy and we have to decompose all that stuff in HTML bars itself so it's not actually done in the view anymore however in versions prior to 113 I believe it was all done here um, so as you do, do you notice the theme is basically like move the nitty gritty detail guts into the thing that's tailor made for it and out of um, the sort of user space mm -hmm. concepts. Um. <clears throat> so we can look at instrumentation support, though it's not terribly, helps if I type right, instrumentation, no. Um, so uh, basically all this is doing is defining a default instrument display computer property, which is what the, um, which is what the Ember inspector uses to show the nice like curly curly foo dash bar invocation syntax. Um, it's, it's just grabbing this instrument display prop and, uh, and, and it looks at helper name and just shows it in curlies. 
Um, ideally, uh, and we can do this today with the, with the current AST now. W ideally, we'd actually show you the exact invocation that you did. Um, so that, that would be a nice future, uh, future win for folks. Um, so, um, so instrument details is called in, in when we're going to render, um, and it um, it wraps the template rendering with like this instrument detail uh, information, um, and that also um, when we call super here, it's also grabbing um, instrument display. So, one thing here. Um, so th this, uh, this template name prop is no longer actually set. So, so you, um, so the, the inspector would show you, um, what template name is being used to display for like if in, in the view hierarchy list, mm -hmm. it would tell you the template name, but in like components today, they don't have a template name. So, um, I want to, I'll, I'll have a, I'll, I'll track down this to do and figure out what, um, what we actually display. I think displaying the helper name would be fine for like a component because it would tell you the component's name, like what your actual component invocation was. So, that is interesting. Um, visibility, uh, visibility support is um, something very, um, basically just dealing with is visible flag when it turns to visible or invisible. Um, this is not a thing that I have used a lot personally. Um, though I'm, I know it's public API, it's just not a, not really a, um, um, a feature that is visible feature of, uh, of views. I haven't really messed with that too much. Um, okay. So compat, uh, the next one is compat adders. If I can figure out how to make my editor go. Um, so this is an attribute proxy and this is what provides, um, so by default, the, in one thirteen. Everything is set on this dot adders, and the only reason they end up back in the root of the object, which is where everyone actually expects them to be, uh, is because of this makes in. So it um, it calls this propagate adders to this, um, and it just calls this dot set properties all of the attributes. So that's that's how this happens. Uh, so this is actually called in the um, like legacy. Uh, I'm sorry. In the um, the did receive adder. So that that's the time frame that you should think about. So when just before the user land did receive did receive adders is called. This is called to propagate uh, forward. Um, and what that does is it makes it so that in your in your user land um, did receive adders you have this dot get foo if foo is an attribute passed to you. Um, Aria roll support, I think, um, just adds an attribute binding for Aria roll. I think, yes, yeah. So it just adds the attribute for this prop, um, and then we set it to null. So, and then the main guts is in this view mixing, which is named weirdly. I recall. Yeah. So the view mixin is named to view support. Okay. Um, so here's where we have the way templates are compiled and tracked down and figured out. Now in Ember component, these, uh, this template and layout props are completely different. They're actually not CPs at all over there. They're just static props. Um, and that's actually removed quite a lot of, uh, well, a decent amount, some more double digit percent, like 10% of the uh, um, performance for, um, uh, for uh, for the initial render because we just have less work to do. So like in because Glimmer itself is figuring out where the layouts are. When we had these as CPs, it was finding the layout from like the module system, like you know, like where you normally would put it, and then it would also get the CP on the on the component instance in case you had defined it manually, like yourself. But um, in the case that you defined it yourself, you almost certainly defined it as a prop, not a CP. So we, we don't need to go through the, the CP, the, the getter um, stuff and, uh, and go down that call path. It's, and if you only use uh, templates in the file system, we, like, it's just an undefined value, so we don't even do any work. So it, it makes the component instantiation quite a lot faster. Um, and I'll show what, that, what we do. We do have to do some, some work in init to, to de detect that layout is, is set and, and do the right thing, but it's not terribly complicated. Um, so we have, 
so this template for name, I don't believe is used anywhere but in here. Um, and it's only for legacy view support for having template name and template and layout name specified. Um, so those I believe are, are roughly gone. Uh, nearest of type uh, and nearest with property, like these, these functions essentially iterate the list of views. Um, so uh, it goes upwards uh, through the parent view hierarchy to detect whether um, a given th this each, uh, it's going up the, up the hierarchy of parent views and trying to detect the first one that matches the, the class you pass in. So like if you wanted to find, like say the, the, the example that I will give, but I hate giving it, is like a tab controller where you have the thing holding the tabs and then you have the individual tab components. Inside those tab components, you might want to find your parent container, like tab container, uh, and like, I don't know, register, self-register or something like that. Um, now, I would argue that you should be doing that with log primes, mm -hmm. um, but that's another story. Um, this has to be supported for backwards compat and stuff. Um, so uh, so that, that's what this does. Um, I, would, I would very strongly suggest you don't do this. Um, and the contextual component stuff that uh, Matt and uh, um, others have landed in Canary as a feature, enabled feature by default, um, makes a lot of this way easier, especially that exact use case. So you would yield for a block param that would be like as, you know, tab, um, and then you are as, you know, tab container. And you'd say tab container dot new tab or something. Um, and it would just be a component invocation without having to curry forward all the arguments and stuff. So, which is pretty great. Um, so then there's the, uh, this dot dollar. This is where this comes from. Um, so in a component review, if you call this at dollar, it, um, it, it uh, defers to the current state. And the reason we do that is because in various states, there either is, a is an element or not. So if you're in a pre-render state and you call this at dollar, you'll get an assertion saying you can't call I don't know. There's, I don't know what the assertion exactly says, but it's basically you can't call this a dollar before it's rendered. Because what does that even mean? Like we don't even know what the elements are because we haven't rendered it yet. Basically, um, also there is this assertion that says you can't call this a dollar on a tag name of blank. Um, tag name blank basically means you have no that specific view or component has no element um, of its own. So uh, the definition of what we would do is kind of weird. Um, there's an open PR that. Um, um, that makes, uh, makes this actually work for tag, tagless components. That's really nice. Um, but it has to essentially traverse the, like the start and end, uh, ranges and build up the jQuery DOM element. Like, because jQuery doesn't let you create a new jQuery object with a range. You have to actually add an array of elements, which is, was, was confusing when I first discovered that, or when I was told that by the guy that had to do it. Um, Okay, so then these are just um, helper methods, render to element, replace in. These are all things that, um, that are not terribly used in um, user code. So now we start getting into hooks. So we have a, a will insert element hook, a did insert element hook. These are probably the most common ones that people are aware of. Um, I haven't used, personally, I haven't used will insert element, I don't think ever. Um, for real code, I use did insert element quite a lot, but I, I don't, I'm sure there's use cases that are uh, very valid. I just, I don't, I don't have them in my head. Um, uh, and then will clear render is, uh, is called just before, um, it's re-rendering basically. Um, also I haven't really used that very much. Um, then, uh, will destroy element is essentially the reverse of did insert element. So it's like your element is going to be removed if you added like DOM <laughs> listeners or something like, a, I don't know, like any event handlers or something, you can remove them. Um, so there was, there were a number of bugs early in the 113, uh, beta cycle where we had, um, we, we had these, uh, like the will destroy wasn't called or it was called two or three times. So then you try to be unhandled, like unregistering things that shouldn't have been there anyways. Um, okay. Um, so then we have, um, pair of you did change again. I've not really used this and it is marked as private. So, um, tag name, this is where you specify the type of thing by default. I think we use a div. So, um, if there is the null value, then we use a div. If the value of actual empty string is there, then we use no element, which is kind of weird. Um, but, uh, but it has its use cases. And I believe, um, I believe we'll be seeing a presentation tomorrow at Ember camp, um, a little bit about some tagless view stuff, which I'm interested in seeing.
Um, okay. Um, so I'm, I would like to talk about this, but uh, this read DOM adder is sort of weird. Um, so let me, let me explain what the, um, what the problem it solves is first. So basically if you have, um, often, many times you might see people do, um, let me not do that, do uh, like, oh, well, you can just use the, um, the DOM API and just have an action that is, um, you know, update or mud or something, but we'll say update value. Uh, and then it gets the new value equals target dot value, I think. Um, and then we'll say value equals value, which is fine. Um, oops. Okay. So that, that looks fine. Um, unfortunately what happens in this case is if you type into this, um, oh, that's a typo. Uh, if you, <laughs> if you type into the input field, it triggers this to re-render because the value has changed, um, because this action fires and populates it up. But since the morph that controls this value prop, doesn't know that the underlying element has already mutated its internal because the element the input element maintains its own internal state so because the underlying uh the, the thing that manages this piece of dom this attribute doesn't know that the underlying state has changed it says my last state was maybe blank and my new state is a like you type the letter a mm -hmm. um so it forces it to add a which means the text text value that you see is the same unfortunately Every time you set the value prop on an element or on an input element, it sets your cursor position to the end. Right. So uh, it's basically a massive self troll that most people, like I fell into this trap a bunch. We had this bug on 1.13 during the beta cycle. Um, and unless you actually tested it with a pre-filled text box and tried to type in the middle, you didn't notice it. Because when you test, oh, does it work? You go to an empty field and you type it in. And yes, it seems to work fine. Uh, so it was very, very aggravating. Um, so anyway, so the, the, the workaround, uh, so, so basically you, there's no workaround for this, uh, invocation like, uh, today that I know of. Um, so, um, the, what the, the, the way that we fix this though, um, in things like, uh, curly curly input helper, um, or I, I wrote a one way input helper that, um, uh, does similar things and uses actions instead of bindings to mm -hmm. update the value. Uh, but anyways, the, the way we deal with this is by asking the morph, like finding the morph in the little nodes, uh, like this is all private structure, um, finding the morph and then telling it to get its current contact, uh, content to force its last known value to like, m like coalesce with what actually is the real value. So in the input case, what it does is it says, Hey, uh, tell this thing to go and update its last known value. Uh, I don't think we have any usages of it outside of the input case in the Ember code base. Um, but it's theoretically possible that any other attribute would have the same sort of problem. Um, it's just, this is the one that's the, the most egregious that is like, oh my goodness, this is horrible. Um, so, um, so yeah, so, uh, so that's, that's what this thing does. It's, it's a massive troll because like, this is, if you know the DOM API, like, you know what on input means and, and aren't like completely hosed there. Uh, this looks great. Like, oh, okay, it's just DOM. I can just write it, um, and that works great for things like select, where you have like on change or um, um, or like maybe on click for like a like a normal thing. Those are great, but but for input specifically, if you use on input or on change, it's going to completely hose the um, the cursor position every time you type, which is super annoying. Um, I guess on change would be slightly better because on change only fires if I recall correctly. Only fires when you leave the field. So I guess at that point, cursor position is not as important. Or maybe when you, yeah, I don't know. You go back, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so anyway, so that's what it does. I, uh, that's a little pet peeve. It took quite a long time to, uh, to track down why that was actually happening, why the cursor position was jumping around. Like, I think multiple days uh, took, took to track down. Um, okay, so the, the um, I think the last thing well, I guess there's a lot more stuff in here, uh, more than I remembered. Um, so, okay, so the next thing is just, just in it. One thing that's new that I am pretty happy with is that in init of a view uh, or a component, we we set 
um, a value to say init was called. So, so this is a thing that I have done many times. Um, accidentally uh, have like ember.component.extend and add init to like console log something or something. And I forget to call it super. Right. And if you forget to call it super, it doesn't error at you or it didn't error at you. And it would just kind of try to go along its merry way, but nothing was set up. There was nothing initialized. You had no current state. Like everything would go off the rails very quickly in super weird arcane error messages. Um, so what we did was we added this flag to say, okay, the parent super was called. Um, and then just after the user land in it is called, we check, um, we check that it was, it was done and we have a nice assertion now that says you must call super when implementing in it in the component, please update. Um, so this was a, that was a thing that was super trolly, um, for, for quite a long time. Uh, just until I think, uh, Ember 2.2 will be the first version that has this released in it. Um, but I don't know. I can't tell you how many times I've done that because I just implemented it and just to get like a debugger or something or a console log or something. And it just goes off the rails very quickly. Um, okay. So these are all, okay. So this is destroyed. This is essentially just unrolling the things that we did previously. We grab, um, like if there's a view name, we update it. This is basically a pretty old API where you could specify interrelated view names instead of like using like block params to yield into children it's basically you set props on sibling views which is kind of weird um okay handle event so this handle event is essentially um it's going to defer to current state but what it does is um the event dispatcher when like a click happens it calls handle event and then it bubbles it through. For example, like if you call, um, the, the reason we use current state is because it, the handle event method is only valid in certain states. Like in pre-render doesn't like calling handle event is, doesn't make sense. There's no event to handle, there's nothing to handle. Um, so we provide like useful errors in the various cases where they don't matter. Um, yeah, so that's basically, it's basically that. Um, so I think that that is the, let me, Go back to this giant mix-in list. Oh man, we are pretty far down the rabbit hole here. Okay, so uh, this core view. Where is it? Okay, yeah, so I think we talked about most all of these. Um, and, uh, and so I think that that seems like a pretty good, um, wrapping point for sort of talking through the view hierarchy. Um, do you want to, do you want to go through some of the, um, pre-baked, uh, views that we have like select, uh, oh, not select, God, not select, um, text field, for example, which is what, uh, input is using just to see how these things are used. Yeah, I think that'd be useful. I mean, from my point of view, a lot of this code is completely foreign. Um, I haven't seen it before. Don't feel so, bad, me either. Right. <laughs> so I, I don't have foreign. any uh, particular questions. I think um, something like text view is going to be more familiar. I've been yes. before. Yes. Uh, what I'm going to do after this is after the video comes out is actually to go through it and refer to the tests. And um, I think this will actually give me a really good picture of these internals. Yeah. The, the way things interdepend um, is sort of confusing at first. It's one of the things that took me the longest to sort of wrap my head around. Um, so, um, so hopefully the sort of walkthrough of the, at least the, the base view stuff will help. Um, okay. So now in, now what we're going to do is we're essentially just going to use all the stuff we just talked about how it actually happens. So we're going to use attribute bindings. We're going to use class names, uh, set the tag name. Um, this instrument display display is just a nice helpful hint. So that the, um, the inspector can show you called curly curly input. Cause that's, that's how you get this text field. Um, so we also have um, default layout is null. I don't think that actually matters anymore, but it did at one point. Um, we have a default empty value of blank, but of course, if you say value equals something, it'll, that's what it'll show. Um, then we have a type field, which is text or can set type of input. Um, so it is, it is a computed because when you set it, 
Um, certain platforms don't allow you to change the type of input. This was for i8. We can probably remove this at this point. But uh, yeah, so in i8, you can't change the type of an input element after initial creation, essentially. Um, so we, we just detect if um, we have this like little helper uh, method and we say, uh, can we do a create element input and then try to do it? If it throws an error, then you can't. Um, so that this is, uh, this is basically, and then we just set some like default max min pattern stuff. Um, now you notice this extends from tech support, uh, which is a mix in here. Um, and it has essentially a bunch more of the same thing. So more attributes. Um, and the thing about te the tech support mix in is that it's shared between text area and text field. So there's a bunch of props that are shared by both an input element and also a text area element. So the, the logic, the shared logic goes in here. Um, so this is a little bit different. Um, so we're also adding, uh, this is where we're adding the, the change event. So um, this change event is fired by the DOM and we call element value to change. This is how the actual values are being, um, like the, the current this dot value in uh, input box. And ultimately be, because of two-way bindings, the whatever you passed in the upstream version, uh, that's how they're updated. Notice this is exactly where we're calling this read DOM adder uh, API. So when the change event fires, we trigger value to change and we, we force that, that underlying uh, node to say, update your last known state to the current value so that we don't have that crazy cursor jumping position thing. Um, so that's that's done right there. Um, also, there's a few other things. So like on input, on cut and paste, we also trigger element value to change. Um, so we have some special behavior uh, for inserting new lines when you hit enter. Um, there's a way to configure whether enter uh, inserts a new line or not in the in the input the text field uh, API um, so that all handles that when the uh, these other events like focus in cancel we're just triggering those events basically so if you pass them they're gonna get triggered and they get the um, the event um, and that's all done that way uh, key up and key down are uh, essentially the same thing except for I think that we do for key up we do a special thing to interpret the events and what is that doing so we, so we go to, ah, uh, so if there is this, where's the events? Is key it the key events are a crazy API. Ah, key events. Okay. So if it is, I, I guess if it's an enter, I, I'm assuming 13 is enter, um, or return or whatever, then we, um, what do we do? Oh, we call a method I see. So, so what we're doing is. What the hell was it? Ah, key up. Where's key up? Here it is. Okay, so so we're calling interpret key events. So if the uh, the key up was an enter, then we we say okay, use the insert new line uh, function. If it was, I assume this is escape. Then we use cancel. Um, cancel is annoyingly named. Uh, whatever. So yeah, so that's, so then insert new line says send action enter and then it sends the action for insert new line. Um, and I wonder if we actually implement those actions. I don't see that we do anything special with them, but, um, but I guess that's for you um, to, to deal with, I guess. Like you would pass it in and then you can deal with it that way. So yeah, so, uh, so that's, that's like how uh, input ends up happening. I don't, want to look at select ever again in my life. Um, the uh, checkbox that we can look at. Checkbox is essentially like, so it's, it only differs when the input helper is invoked with type equals text or type equals checkbox. And I think that we you don't even have to say type, I think we default to text, which is also what the browser does, so that's fine. Um, so we don't extend any um, mix-ins here. We just use, um, we just implement class names and attribute bindings. Um, and sort of go to town. Um, we have this on change and um, just update element value on change. Now, to be honest, it seems this seems a little fishy to me. Like I would expect us to just implement this as change, the change event, 
instead of doing it that way. We'll see. Maybe maybe I'll PR that. <laughs> uh, anyways, it just seemed odd. That interaction there seemed odd because um, it didn't actually do anything. So, um, yeah. Okay, so that's those are the main um, internal ones. The only other um, the only other internal components that we have are things for like link to um, what else? Uh, I think outlet is kind of a view, but those are in other packages. Those are like uh, Ember routing views. Um, so that would be link to is the only one here, and then outlet. Uh, these these two. Uh components we looked at actually inherit from component? Yes, both of these inherit from, so uh, input, text area, uh, checkbox, they all in, uh, extend from Ember component. Right, yeah. which we haven't looked at yet. Yeah, great point. <laughs> uh, that's because we moved the folder because we didn't want it to be named views anymore and I forgot about it. Um, okay, so here is, uh, here's Ember component. So. Um, so basically, um, we extend this target action support, and this is uh, this target action support. We'll look at it, but uh, this is what provides the set send action. So in the rest of the system, the API, like in the views or routes, this, the API is basically this dot send, and it goes to say what's my target object, and then it uh, it calls send on the target object. Um, in in components though, because we wanted them to be like optionally isolated, not, not optionally, we wanted you to allow like send actions for things that maybe the outside world doesn't care about so they don't have to listen to them. Um, so that's why we added this level of indirection for target action support. Um, I find it actually pretty hard to debug and walk through the code like when I am in, in debugging to figure out why an action is not triggering here. Um, so we can, we can definitely look at that and see what that's doing. Um, but let's look at this first. Um, so instrument name, just we put component, and then we try to put the component's name for the display. So what this does is it grabs the underscore debug container key value, which is essentially the full name in the container. So be like component colon, like foo slash, foo dash bar or something, if you invoke it that way. Um, so uh, it, is, it is private, um, though it's, um, I think we would generally be okay with exposing it. Unfortunately, everything we expose as a public thing on the root of an object takes away another word. Like having um, debug container key is pretty unique, I guess. But um, you know, we, we, putting a thing called container key or key would be potentially breaking other people that might use a thing called a key. So, so we have to be careful there. Um, I also somewhat dislike um, having it be a string. I would rather, because we parse it, in, when we resolve all the objects, we parse those strings down into like uh, full name, full name without type, full name with type. Like it'd be nice to just have that POJO just right there so we can say, you know, we could get the full name if we wanted, but then we don't have to do the split on every component. What, this only happens when you have the, the inspector open, but still, it, we already have done the splitting once, why are we doing it again? So so there's an open issue to, um, to fix that or, or work around that. Okay, so here is uh, init. Um, essentially, the uh, first thing we do is call super. Uh, that is uh, gonna call all that stuff we already walked through in the view hierarchy. Um, then it calls, uh, it sets the controller and the context to this. So this, this overrides those other uh, context support mix in. It doesn't override it, just it, it says, okay, always the context and the controller are the current component instance, um, which makes it a lot saner to deal with in the template land. Um, then we have, uh, so this is where I mentioned before, uh, I'll just show you. So see here we have template, layout name, and layout all specified as null here. Um, that's because we don't actually want them to be CPs. This is the thing I was talking about in, um, in the view support. Um, so what we do in init is we say, okay, well, if um, there is no layout and there's a layout name and we have a container, then like go get the layout. Um, and, and call that template for name, which is basically just going to the resolver to find the template with that name. Um, and then we set this dot layout to that. Um, note that layout is not an observable property, so you can't change it after initial render. You can theoretically change it before render, like if you had like a will render and you wanted to change it, I think that would actually work, but you can't, if it's rendered, you can't change layout because we don't look for the block 
again after the first render. Like we don't go looking for an additional template. Um, in theory, that, that is fixable, but uh, it's still kind of odd to change your layout anyways. It's hard to reason about that system and it would make the code harder to reason about too. Um, okay, so then we have uh, default layout. We deprecated specifying default layout to a component. So, so this just provides backwards compatibility and tells you hopefully what to do, uh, including the link to, um, to like the deprecation guide on, on what, what this means. Uh, hopefully, as we move forward, uh, every new deprecation will have a link like this where it'll say exactly, hey, go here, see, um, see what like before and after. Um, Uh, so this is basically saying, oh, you had specified default layout, now you just do that. So it's just telling you before and after, which um, is nice. Uh, so I know many people had a hard time earlier uh, in the like 113 cycle where those deprecations didn't really provide guidance and it wasn't obvious at all what the heck you're supposed to do. Yeah. Um, so we're definitely okay. trying to beef up on that and, and get much, much better about what to do there. What do you think about getting uh, Ember Watson commands where they exist in there or in the actual depreciation? Uh, so so in, in, the, in this guide, I think we should absolutely put that there. Like if, if there was one, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think there is one for this. Right. Um, though this would be an easy thing to have a Watson rule for, I, I think, because you're literally just changing the prop name. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, if, if I understand how the internals work at Watson very well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, this is like a simple, one of the simplest possible cases. Yeah. But um, in the in in like a more complicated case, yeah, we sh we should totally like add to this is in the website repo, emberjs slash website repo. Um, yeah, we should absolutely add like um, we should describe the change and hopefully the reasoning if it's um, if it's not just blatantly obvious. Like some some are just naming J. Oh, we like this name better, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> so like okay, that's totally subjective. But, um, but you know, things like this, like, okay, this is how you do it. But then we should totally have a section down here and say, oh, okay. And by the way, there's this Ember Watson rule. You can use it. Um, though I would prefer not to like have to go in to like explaining what is Ember Watson. Like it should just be like some links, like there's an Ember Watson rule to make this much simpler. Mm -hmm. Click here to read more or something. And it's just linked to the Watson. Yeah. Cause the Watson readme has like details of the rule. I think all the rules that it provides to have like a little link in the readme, yeah. I think. I know at Intercom we're keen to actually automate as much as possible. So I can see us contributing to Amber Watson. Yeah, yeah, the, that, and that's, uh, that's really, really awesome. And I think, um, so one of the things, uh, while we're off on the Watson side, uh, one of the things that I really want to see is I want to see um, support, better support or any support for doing that kind of transformation for template stuff. Yep. Um, so, so right now <laughs> you can do it, but you basically have to resort to like regexes. Yes, essentially, yes. you you have to do string manipulation, yeah. um, which is um, which is sort of way horrible, <laughs> like really really bad. So we, um, we've uh, I guess there's been some discussion about using some of the uh, handlebars templates uh, compiler and the, the actual AST to yes. be able to do these transforms in a similar way that we use Babel to do the. So, so the, in the in HTML bars and Glimmer, like there is an internal AST. You can actually access it via like AST plugins and stuff. But we didn't have a way to emit, like take the AST and emit the source back out. Um, so there is, uh, there's recently landed on HTML bars master. It may be actually in the version we're using for um, Ember 2.2. Um, but uh, there's there's a way to emit it, but uh, it's not 100% lossless. Uh, and I don't mean it breaks your code. It, like it, it doesn't necessarily like if you use hard tabs versus spaces, mm -hmm. or if you like that kind of stuff is actually really complicated to get right because RAST from uh, from a template evaluation perspective doesn't matter. Like those don't matter at all. Like the spaces just get embedded in the output, the emitted DOM, mm -hmm. and that like if you have new lines or spaces. But um, but yeah, but that's essentially all that's going on there. Um, so yeah, so uh, so that's built in, and I think that through the the sort of glimmer rewrite that Yehuda has been working on, a lot more of the details have been wired through from the guts to say um, all the information we possibly can have to make it easier to do that emitting. So and I, and I think um, once that refactor lands, I think we'll be in a much better shape to actually um, 
uh, to, to, to actually like have this be a real first class citizen thing. Now, I have no idea what the APIs will look like from a Watson perspective. And I don't know that we actually want to make the AST itself like public API, though like internal tooling that we maintain uh, can certainly, should certainly use it. And, and the, the benefit would be huge. Like for example, like how awesome would it have been if we had a way to do like the bind editor transition from like not a human, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's not hard, it's just tedious and annoying. Right. Uh, it's like, we have computers, they can do these things. I, I did about 900 of them. Yeah. Uh, well, weeks, yeah. so, so the, the, you can do a regex for right. some of it, but it becomes hard uh, in some cases because of, well, I find a number of cases where there was just bugs in what I was doing, because like bind editor, for example, will let you specify the same key twice. Right. So, and yeah, it works yeah, fine, I, but uh, it, only the last one wins. <laughs> I, I introduced a couple of bugs like that where the regex just didn't handle a specific case. Yeah. So exactly like that. Um, yeah. Um, this is why I'm so I, I got so interested in Emma Watson and, and yes, I'm keen, it should keen it should support. it should absolutely be a thing. Um, and then the other things you see here in the deprecation invocation is the new ID flag and the until value. Until basically tells you when the support for this deprecated thing is gone, mm -hmm. essentially. So this tells us that uh, the thing will be until 3.0 because it was public API and obviously we don't have, have we can't have breaking changes. But um, but the nice thing here is that this exposes tooling like Ember CLI deprecation workflow or the inspector itself to now say, well, don't worry about deprecations that are more than two versions in the future or that are not the next version or something yeah. uh, when the version is known. The only, the only issue with saying 3.0 is that technically we don't know like is 3.0 going to be after one uh, two ten? Is it good? like so? That's still a little wishy washy, but we can um, you know that we can deal with that in the tools and just redeploy them when we know. But uh, but that is really neat because that basically means that um, like so in the ramp up to 2.0 there were a bunch of deprecations. Some of them were going to be removed in 2.0 and some of them were not. Uh, so like it would have been way nicer for you to only have to deal with the ones that work specifically for like th if i don't do these now i have to, i can't upgrade essentially yeah. so that stuff um, would be very very helpful uh and then um so this is a new assertion on canary um that was just added um regarding tagless components so since tagless components don't have an element at all there's no elements wrapping it if you implement a click handler or a change handler or something on the component it's never going to get called um and you probably think it will <laughs> so so we we don't want to um uh we, we don't want to like we want to err early and right away to say hey you have a click handler on a dom or on a tagless thing uh this can never work it's just not a thing that can work Previously, we would have people raising issues to say, hey, I implemented click and I have tag name equals blank. Why isn't it working? Well, <laughs> you can pick one or the other. You can't have both. Such is life, I guess. Um, okay, so target object is supporting um, the target action support. Um, this is um, this is sitting, the, oh, sorry. There are fireworks in London. It's wonderful. Um, so I guess what this is just doing is a saying, if there's an underscore controller, use it, uh, otherwise grab my parent views controller. Um, in the case of an actual component that you're actually invoking in a template, underscore, underscore controller is always passed. So it would hit this first value. Um, and I believe it's always passed as the parent views controller. So, so that's what tells it what the target is for the, 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 like when you say send action, that's what it knows. That's how it figures out the target. And here, send action. So, um, so send action is leaning on the internal target action support stuff. But essentially, what it does is, and it's kind of crazy. Um, we first thing you pass send action is the action name, right? If you don't give it an action, we use the value action by default. So, <laughs> so that you can invoke send action, open close paren, and not give it any action name. Unfortunately, that also means you can't provide any arguments. Mm -hmm which is sort of annoying also, but a whole, that's a whole other thing. Um, so then we try to figure out, well, do we have the action name? Um, this should be just, we should get rid of that. Um, just look up the action name on the current context, and then we call validate action, which is 
Uh, what's it doing? It's looking to see if the action name is a thing. Yeah, that's fine. So it's just looking to see if the action name, it, it's grabbing the action name out of a, a mutable cell. So since everything in the template layer is mutable, it just, it's unwrapping that, but that's not terribly important. Um, then we say, okay, if there's no action name, we didn't find anything, then just do nothing, just bail out. Um, and this is the case when you call send action foobar and know when your component was invoked and foobar wasn't passed, it just does nothing, it just send no op. If you use send, it would do similar things. However, it would throw. Like if you call send and there is no target um, action implemented on, on the, on the target, I'm sorry, if there's no action implemented, then it'll throw an error. Uh, and I think that error is, is down, well, no, it's in super down here in send. So, uh, but that's not terribly important. No, we're not calling super. <coughs> so, Yeah, there, we are totally overriding super, in, or uh, the parent version of send in Ember component. Um, anyways, let's finish, let's finish this part. Um, okay, so um, if the action name is a function, we just call it. Uh, so that's what lets you call send action. And uh, if the action is provided to you as a closure action uh, in, in the current um, setup, you would just invoke the function and it would work. Um, it seems a little bit odd to me that we apply null to force the context of the function to be null. That seems pretty weird. Like, I don't know why we don't just, uh, we're probably doing that just to get spread. So we can, yay, ES6. Um, so the, the point wasn't to, to have it be null, the point was to be able to give it an array of args. Um, okay, so otherwise we call this that trigger action. And this is the thing that's impl implemented by target action support. And what it's doing, um, now we go down the rabbit hole further. So it's basically saying, grab the action and the target object, check to see, um, if there is an action context specified. I don't think we specified one here. Oh, we do, sorry. We do. Um, so if there is one, then we, we, we get that the value. Otherwise, the, we default it to this. Um, and then we try to call, if, if we have a target, we try to call send on it. Um, but remember, in send action, if we didn't find a thing passing to us, we do nothing. Basically, so so in the end, send action is just deferring to target dot send, uh, but only if target had it only if you had been provided the action name. Um, so that's the biggest difference there, um, and all the rest of this is basically to support bubbling if if it's not you know to bubble or not bubble and all that kind of jazz. Um, so so that's that's basically that. Now, send send still works in uh, in an action or in a um, in a component. Uh, but it's not the main API. This would essentially target the, the component itself. So if you call this.send, it's gonna send an action to yourself. In this case, it's just grabbing it directly out of this.actions, which is just a pojo of functions. Um, and then it calls it. Now, I don't, so in this case, so has action is the actual action here, because we're grabbing it. This is the function. I don't know why we do this again. Like, this should just be, That's a stupid name now. Whatever. YOLO. Um, what's a better name? Action. I like the way you think. All right. Why is this griping at me? Well, whatever. I'm not gonna do that. Screw my editor. Um, it 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 thinks this is a mistake because you have it in an if. When you're doing assignment in an if. Uh, it 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 thinks that I am doing something stupid. Um, and maybe I am, but 
That's fine. So, okay, so that's it. Woo! That was brilliant. Yeah, I can't believe I forgot actually to go through <laughs> Component. <Yeah. laughs> but um, you notice like the actual code in Component, um, aside from like all of this is like deprecation bits basically. Oh, <laughs> sugar. Um, so all this is just like deprecation stuff and assertions. But the, the code is, is, uh, is pretty, uh, pretty slim. Most of the work now is done in the templating language, uh, in layer, like in HTML bars and in Glimmer itself. Like all the things with the, like actually implementing all these class name bindings and um, uh, class names, class name bindings, attribute bindings, whatever else, all those other things, tag name, I guess. It's all done in the, the templating system um, now. So, which which is nice. It gives us a nice layer of extraction in the in the view layer. Um, so, um, so yeah. So I think that uh, I think that's good. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you.